Hello beautiful bookish people. My name is Hannah and today it's been a long time coming. We are reading Midnight Sun by Stephanie Meyer. Yep, that's me. I had a long debate on whether or not I wanted to do this reading vlog. Number one, I didn't think anybody would want it. And number two, I wanted to hear what other people had to say first. And it's literally been a year and I think I am ready to dive into it. In fact, I didn't think people wanted this video until people, some people started tweeting at me, which I want to tell you never happens. But I told myself, if we're going to make a video about Midnight Sun, we're gonna have to unpack everything. We're gonna have to do a ton of research because there's so much to talk about. There's so many little nuances that involve Twilight. So we we had to read Dracula. Wow. We had to read Anne Rice. Wow. And of course we had to read a psychology book on Twilight just wow. for preparation for this video. I think I'm more prepared than when Stephanie Meyer first wrote Twilight, quite frankly. But now I have... Whoa. Hello? But now that I know the vampire history, we've done our own independent research, I think we are ready to talk about Midnight Sun because I think Midnight Sun and Twilight and Stephanie Meyer exist in this weird gray area. I think it did a lot of good, but it also did a lot of bad. From But from that bad, there have been very productive conversations. Getting the general public to talk more openly about racism, representation, the subtext, and the, the love story of Twilight. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna try to unpack everything and talk about all of the issues, the good, the bad, and of course, the ugly. And one of the only things I do regret about my like previous like Twilight reading vlogs is like towards the end I always have this sort of disclaimer that says like you can like problematic things as long as you acknowledge it, which I think is a loaded statement because I want to dive into everything and I want to say like just because you acknowledge something doesn't make the harm go away. But we're going to be trying to do our best and talking about what I think is one of the most wonderfully average book series in the world. <laughs> so um, come along. It's been a long time coming, but I think I'm finally ready. Okay. It is the next day and we've read a good 150 pages and so much has happened. <laughs> First thing I kind of want to talk about is the common critique or criticism that Bella's boring. Why would ev everybody in this small town be drawn to her when she says nothing? And to that I say, you've never been in a small town. From my perspective, as someone who was in a very like close-knit high school community, I had like 50 people graduating in my class. If somebody had Tic Tacs at lunch and that's all they had, that would spread like wildfire. So like if somebody new came into the community, they would be filled with intrigue and mystery. Somebody new to talk to and so you're not talking to Jake for the 30th time about how he can eat a whole rotisserie chicken or whatever. So that has never been an issue to me. And I also think it's a little bit sexist to demean Bella into something like she's so boring, why would anybody want her? Because she clearly has a personality, it's just toned down and I think Stephanie Meyer is trying to express that in this book. Bella's relationship with her mom has always been like uno reversed, meaning like Bella has always been the parent in the situations. There were like passages in Twilight where Bella said she cooked meals for both her and her mom and there would be gallivants that her mom would want to go on so like the only stability Bella had in her life didn't come from a parental figure but herself. Bella had to mature extremely fast based on who her mother was. And it also suits that, of course, Stephanie Meyer would make her more low-key because she is the vessel that she's introducing us to this great fantastical vampire world. She's a self-insert with personality. That's what I've concluded. Another thing I want to talk about is it's so 
clear sometimes what Stephanie Meyer is doing. <laughs> like, we all know that she's Mormon, and like, the way that Edward talks about not wanting to fall for temptation because of Bella is very clear the intentions uh, behind it. And like, here's the thing, I think there's a difference between like putting your own worldview in it, I think you have a right to it, but when you cross the line of being problematic, I think that's where the issue lies. What we can critique Stephanie Meyer on is when she takes it too far. Um, and I'm specifically talking about how like when Twilight was becoming a movie she didn't want any people of color in it. Like the fact that there are no vampires of color because she explicitly tells them they turn white after turning into a vampire. And it's like, okay Stephanie. And I think that's when it starts to like muddy the water. Like I said, everyone has a philosophy, but are you trying to depict vampires accurately or is it because you didn't let black people into the church until the 80s? That's up to you to decide. But I think you can't reference Midnight Sun without talking about the meme, but what if I'm the monster? What if I'm the monster? That's been here all along. He's so obsessed with calling himself a monster. I can never tell if Stephanie Meyer wants me to take it seriously because she'll have this long, melodramatic monologue of I'm a monster and inhumane and I'm gonna burn in hell for eternity. But then in the next chapter, she'll have a vampire cannonballing into the snow. And I'm like, what is your tone? <laughs> I love that Stephanie is kind of trying to show Bella's strengths in this one, how she's intuitive and emotionally intelligent, and the fact that she just notices how Edward's eye color changes. Like, I would never be able to tell that Edward is a vampire. Number one, I eat junk food so I know my blood doesn't taste good, and two, I hate eye contact. <laughs> I also just like kind of want to really quickly talk about the psychology of Twilight just a little bit because I don't think it's a convenience that in the year 2020, right in the middle of a pandemonium, Twilight suddenly had a resurgence. And I think there is a difference from when Twilight was popular 10 years ago because the 13 year olds that have now matured with Twilight are now 23 year olds and can acknowledge its flaws and there's sort of a self-awareness to liking it and I don't think it's happening by convenience that in the year where we're all stuck at home and life doesn't have direction that an area of comfort for so many people became popular again. Going back to something you grew up with with a more critical eye I think is great and I think Twilight is one of the perfect vessels for that. Hi! Hi. I just want to say it's raining in Texas. It's almost like God knew I was gonna read Midnight Sun. I also just want to say Edward is so freaking dramatic and sometimes it's hard to take him. I love him but it's like dude you gotta chill out. We're getting like some new information too because Edward can read minds and we find out that Charlie's thoughts are not muted like his daughter's, but they are certainly on a low volume, which is just interesting for the world and what we know of Twilight. But um, that's not why I've sat you down and opened up the camera. I just want to talk about the car crash scene. Please insert a clip if you would like, Hannah. Ha ha ha! Oh no! <gasps> and boom! <laughs> right afterward, Edward decides to have a family meeting to discuss the problem of the human. And the most common debate held within the meeting is, should we kill Bella? <laughs> and then Alice gets a vision and envisions Bella with golden eyes like a vampire. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's her destiny, bro. And kind of from that moment, Edward knows. Bella is the love of his life because Alice gets visions. 
and it kind of brings up the question is it more acceptable his actions based on what he knows about the future so he kind of thinks about leaving he kind of thinks about killing her and personally yeah it does make me a little uncomfortable but i also think we have to put view it in the context of like vampires as a whole because vampires have never been ethical dracula is an offset of gothic literature dracula is one of the pioneers of the horror genre horror came off of gothic literature and gothic literature was intended to kind of gross you out. It played with the unbounded realities and ghosts and wives in the attic and, and incest. So an offshoot of that is a monstrified version, which is where we get the horror genre from. So of course, horror is not gonna be ethical. It's playing around with the unreasonable and what comes from unreasonable monsters but then you have this weird monster who isn't like other vampires doesn't like to drink love and likes a human and then you combat that with the fact that he's 17 and has anxiety and intrusive thoughts and it's like well what do you believe because stephanie meyer kind of gives it a reason as to why he's staying in the bedroom so often as she sleeps to kind of get used to her fumes so he can be closer to her in the day and it's like i get that stephanie but i kind of wish in the year 2020 we kind of backed off from that because it's so interesting to see her address the fact that bell is boring or that she's a damsel in distress in this book she kind of somewhat addresses the Quailute tribe, which we'll get to in a minute, um, and tries to take back stereotypes and addresses them by their name, but then goes full-fledged into depicting stalking. It's so interesting to see Stephanie Meyer be so aware of the critiques of her book about Bella being a damsel and the negative representations of Native Americans, and then go full force into Edward stalking. Now Edward feels terrible about it, he's a monster, does that make it better? No. And now, because this book is published in 2020, it's kind of held to now a different rubric than 2005, but it still holds a nostalgic place for some people who can now acknowledge its problems. And you see what I mean? It's just such a weird, area of like it did so much good it did so much bad but good came from the bad and i'm left with a melodramatic 17 year old vampire who stalks <laughs> oh it's a predicament i just want to note that bella's hair is mahogany as described by edward i think i can make a joke about this later so keep this in mind all right, it's a new day, which means there's a new discussion because we have gotten our first description of Jacob Black, which I think can lead us into the discussion of indigenous representation in Midnight Sun and Twilight as a result. Spoiler alert, it's not good. So if you are unfamiliar, the Twilight series depicts a tribe called the Quilutes tribe, which is a tribe that actually exists in in western Washington. And the common critique of Twilight is depicting indigenous people or the Quilut tribe as a wolf pack, as dogs, as savages. And sometimes they're even depicted as uncontrollably violent. There's a character, I believe, we get to know in New Moon where her partner has visibly scarred her and it's kind of brushed aside as being normal for werewolves. The tendency for, for Stephanie Meyer to depict indigenous people as violent and, and angry and abusive and obsessive harkens back to some some pretty racist stereotypes. And there's also a discussion of how the Quailu tribe also exists in the real world and Stephanie Meyer took their stories to fit her narrative and it even goes as far as certain museums hanging up monuments to correct Stephanie Meyer's attempts at changing their story and there becomes an ethical issue because Stephanie one 
didn't ask anybody from the Quaalute tribe. She didn't conduct any surveys or research of her own. She didn't talk to anybody. And two, the Quaalute tribe has never received compensation from Stephanie Meyer. Which is honestly a shame because there have been a couple articles showing the Quaalute tribe's school is built on flooding ground and they're trying to rebuild it to make it a secure campus again um and also if you want to contribute i will have a link down in the description so that you can show your support so it makes total sense that this is one of the most talked about issues surrounding the twilight saga and the way stephanie meyer kind of depicts them in such like weirdly exotic and romanticizing them in exotic ways is just weird and bad but i will say some people from the quaalute tribe have spoken up and i think um if i can find it i'll put in a clip right here of the quaalute tribe talking about it it's brought us a lot of national attention and uh you know, there's still people that are just so amazed when they come out here to visit us. Wow, they're really here. You know, they're really cool people. Um, it's opened the way for our tribe economically. Of course, you got the media coming out doing coverage of us, and they got to see that little glimpse of our reservation. Um, it helped us. So, again, you're kind of left in this weird gray area of that it was such bad representation that it made fans look into it and it sucks and it's bad but now good is coming from it and you're kind of left like what is the right ethical thing to do so much bad representation came from it but now it allowed a conversation to develop that educated a lot of people and it's like what is right i don't know hi it's the next day and I'm going to make a cup of coffee while I talk to you about stocking. I forgot, number one, the ice. But what I was going to say is I forgot that Stephanie Meyer kind of gives a reasoning behind the stocking. So Edward is a vampire, yeah? I think we've established Duh. that. And so whenever he's with Bella, his throat burns because he's craving blood. But what he notices is that when he's with her for longer periods of time, he's kind of able to build up a tolerance. So that is the reason he justifies going to Bella's room at night, is so that he can kind of build up a tolerance to her blood and her sweet, sweet, juicy blood. Which makes sense. Does it make it less creepy? No. Emmett calls him out on it, Alice calls him out on it, and yet he still does it. Twilight is the perfect ethical conundrum. Um, for some reason, it's telling me in my notes to look up page 339, so let's do that. Okay, this is gonna sound crazy, but th there's a moment during this like weird conversation Bella and Edward are having, Edward is just basically asking her all the basic questions, like what's your favorite color, and it feels more like an interview than anything else, but Edward asks, so like what do you want to do, what are your future plans, and Bella says, something with books, like well not exactly like my mom, if I could I like to teach at a college level somewhere, probably a community college. Not Bella and I having the same career aspirations, but it just proves to me again that Bella is the everyday girl. And coming for Bella means you are coming after every girl who has ever identified with her, which I think is a little bit sexist. But that's the kind of update for today. I'm more than halfway through, so that's exciting, and I will just get back to reading. Bye. Oh, wow. There's... So much white going on here, including this. But we just got to the baseball scene! It's America's pastime, it's vampire's pastime, and it's just as iconic as I remember. This time we get a little more insight into Edward and Rose's dynamic. We get to see a beautiful and cute conversation between Bella and Esme. And as you know, what happens with the baseball scene is inevitably when the plot comes in. So there is this 
rogue pack of vampires that come in and they just want to play baseball they see the fun times and they're like hey let's join in on the fun and we kind of get some new information jasper has this ability to make emotions more prominent so he's making emmett look intimidating he's making edward look more angry and he's presenting carlisle as being this charming man that you want to agree with him while jasper's also suppressing himself and bella and alice the only reason we get plot in this book is you boil it down is because there was a gust of wind like what <laughs> So, um, they're gonna go away, they don't notice Bella, that Bella's a human, and then a gust of wind happens, and the tracker James smells Bella, and how intoxicating her blood is, and it's just like, oh, you've brought a snack. And so, it comes in this plan of what we're gonna do with Bella, what we're gonna do with Charlie. That's he neither here nor there, because it all happens because of a wind! Thank you, Wind, for all your service, for helping us produce energy, for making windmills look pretty, and also giving the plot to Twilight. <laughs> I love it. It's so stupid, and I love it. That's kind of where I am. They're kind of conducting the plan. And by the way, Bella comes up with the plan because she's a reader. She knows how to do these things. And just because you read Agatha Christie doesn't mean you can solve a mystery. But Bella! Swan can uh, but I'm gonna get back to reading um, finish it up we might be able to finish it tonight it's kind of late but we'll see guys we've done it we finished midnight Sun give me one second okay we're back so fun fact about me is I am a romantic and over romanticized things and we had to change shirts because in every vlog that I've done for Twilight I've worn that shirt at the end and we're not messing with tradition I also really like this shirt it's fun it's fresh and it's a little boy shirt guys we have officially finished Midnight Sun this is such a dumb joke but James throws Bella into mirrors and she crashes it in my also quickly Hannah let's just reference back to the fact that Bella's hair is mahogany I just want to note that Bella's hair is mahogany that is mahogany I know I'm so sorry I'm stupid but it was right there and it was I've been thinking about that joke for like three days now and I couldn't not say it and then also three pages later in on page 207 Edward has this sort of prayer and I am about to say this right now I'm gonna tell you this right now that page 703 is the best piece of writing Stephanie Meyer has ever produced Whoa! it's like filled with like so much emotion and anguish and agony that like two paragraphs if you like Twilight any and at all that paragraph is worth the entire book. I'm gonna tell you that right now. But yeah, those are kind of my last thoughts about Midnight Sun. I wanted to do this because I had known in every one of my other videos that I didn't talk about the issues. I always blanket statement said, as long as you acknowledge the problems and understand the problems, then you can like what you want to like. And I, what I wanted to do with this video is I don't think Midnight Sun is a perfect book. I don't think any book in the Twilight series is a perfect book, but I think it exists in this gray area of like it did good things, but it also did bad things, but from the bad things good things are happening. Conversations are evolving, representation is getting better, and I still think it's okay to like problematic books. I just think there's like way more to unpack than I, what I usually did in these videos. To conclude, because I just think it's a perfectly average commercial book and it doesn't deserve the like visceral hate that it gets, but it does need to be discussed. Um, but with that being said, I hope you enjoyed it. I am sorry this video is like a year late and I will see you next time. Keep reading and all that jazz.
All right, it's a new day and they're, what? Okay. That was my clock and she was very long. A phone call? Now shush, please. I'm trying to talk about vampirisms. Why does my clock always gotta interrupt me? Do you think Edward would listen to Bad Guy by Billie Eilish? Okay, me too.